Um, as is uh, as is customary in um, uh, at events um, at uh, York University, uh, I'm going to begin uh, with uh, a, a land acknowledgement. Um, so York University recognizes that uh, many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories uh, upon which university campuses are located that precede the establishment of the university. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tegranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes regions. Now, as I um, read that uh, land uh, acknowledgement, um, I'm uh, mindful uh, that um, reconciliation uh, with uh, Indigenous uh, peoples is something that requires more than kind of a, a checklist uh, type approach to um, uh, events uh, like uh, this, that the land uh, acknowledge it, that the land when uh, we uh, at the university uh, are, um, um, are uh, engaging um, uh, with uh, uh, various uh, issues, in this case, international uh, migration uh, law, uh, that we need to take seriously uh, perspectives um, and uh, legal orders uh, that uh, have uh, not been accorded the place uh, that they uh, deserve in uh, scholarly um, conversations. And so with that uh, in mind, uh, what I'd like to do uh, in the next few minutes is to share uh, a video about uh, the way that uh, one particular uh, Indigenous uh, community that's located um, a couple hours away uh, from uh, Toronto um, Akwesasne, uh, which is a Mohawk community. Um, I'm going to show a video of how that uh, community experiences some of the uh, issues that we're going to be uh, talking about uh, today. So I'm going to I'm going to share my screen. Just bear with me here. Okay, so when um, I uh, see that uh, video, I'm, I'm particularly struck by the comments um, by uh, Bill uh, Sunday, uh, who says uh, that the, uh, uh, the border uh, is uh, a border uh, for you, uh, not a border uh, for uh, us. Uh, and that's a, a perspective, that's a principle that is reflected in a number of uh, international legal uh, instruments uh, that enshrine those uh, principles. Uh, all too often, uh, when uh, we hear accounts of international migration law, uh, that perspective, uh, those um, principles, and those legal instruments are simply absent uh, from uh, the conversation. And one of the many reasons why uh, I am excited about uh, today's uh, Howard Edelman lecture um, is that our uh, speaker um, uh, intends to uh, present a, a, an account of international migration law uh, that includes some space uh, for uh, those perspectives, for those principles, uh, and for those uh, international uh, legal instruments. So uh, with uh, all of that in mind, I am uh, delighted to introduce our main speaker uh, for uh, today. Uh, Thomas uh, Spikerbor. Uh, Thomas is a professor of migration law at uh, Rie University in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, he is uh, an <clears throat> excuse me. He is an expert on uh, inequities uh, in um, uh, global inequities in the movement of people. Uh, he's an expert on uh, migration and uh, asylum procedures. Uh, he's also uh, one of the uh, leading thinkers on um, questions related to 
uh, gender and uh, sexuality in uh, asylum uh, law, uh, an interest that we uh, share uh, and that we've had the opportunity to engage uh, with one another um, remotely uh, by email and, and through some of our work. Um, but this is the first time that we've had not, that Thomas and I have had an opportunity to uh, see one another. Um, and to chat uh, directly with one another. So I'm grateful uh, that uh, Thomas has accepted our invitation uh, to uh, speak uh, with us uh, today. Um, so the way uh, the uh, day is going to uh, run is that uh, Thomas is gonna speak for uh, about 40 minutes to an hour. Uh, following that, we're gonna have uh, two interventions uh, from two discussants who I will uh, introduce uh, later. Uh, and then we should have some time for a Q and A uh, with uh, the audience, so Thomas, uh, welcome. I'm looking forward to your talk. I'm a big fan of your uh, work, uh, and uh, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sean. Thanks for the for the generous welcome, and I hope I won't uh, won't disappoint you. I want to begin by sharing my screen. Um, Okay, so I want to begin by showing you, uh, you this map. Uh, on this map, the nationals of uh, countries that are white uh, need entry visas for less than 100 countries, and nationals of countries that are gray on the map need entry visas for more than 100 countries. This map that was developed by Yusuf Altamimi uh, visualizes the global inequality of mobility. In other words, it visualizes international migration law or the effects of it. Roughly speaking, people from Europe, from the Anglophone set settler societies in North America, Australia, New Zealand, as well as, as South Korea and Japan, these people can move across the world with great ease, while As Asians, Africans and Latinos cannot. This is a very blunt summary that has to be qualified and actually has been qualified, but the general picture doesn't change. So this map suggests that Global mobility is unequal along the lines of race and colonial history. But is that really the case? Because it would be remarkable, international migration law does not differentiate on the grounds of race, but on the ground of nationality. Also, differentiation on the ground of race would be an evident violation of the prohibition of racial discrimination. As Ashil Bembi and others have shown, the concept of race was developed in close connection with colonialism. And if we want to investigate the possible relation between international migration law on the one hand and on the other hand colonialism and race, we should use a methodology that doesn't a priori exclude the possibility of noticing the role of race and colonialism. On the basis of insights of Sergio Diaz, I take it that this has three consequences. First, from a temporal perspective, we should use a timeline that makes it possible to see the role of colonialism, if any, and we should not begin our analysis in 1990 or 2015. Those are, at least in the European context, very fashionable years to, to begin the story. Second, structurally, we cannot automatically assume that with formal independence, the dependence of countries in the global south resulting from colonialism has ended. Thirdly, from an epistemic standpoint, the analysis cannot be limited to acts of formal colonial powers and must include and fully include the acts of colonized and marginalized regions. In this talk, I will use these three, methodologi me these three met methodological insights so as to sketch the contours of an approach to international migration law. And I'll, it, because this talk, at least virtually, takes place in Toronto, I will pay particular attention to the role of settler colonies. This approach does not necessarily lead to the conclusion that international migration law is colonial or, or racialized, because maybe it's not. But it's an effort to make it possible to see colonial and racial phenomena if and to the extent that they are present. As a consequence of these, uh, these uh, uh, starting points, I will begin with a historical overview of international migration law. The earliest source that I'm aware of dates back to the 16th century. Francisco de Vitoria, whom you see a, a, a modern painting, was an early modern Spanish academic and he was uh, advisor to Emperor Charles V. 
in a lecture he gave in 1539, De Indis Recenter Inventis, on the recently discovered Indies, he touched upon the question whether the Spanish colonists had the right to seize the lands of the Native Americans. He opens this discussion with the right to migrate. Vitoria posits that there is a right to travel and to live in other countries, provided one does not harm the natives. To keep people who do no harm, that is, in this context, the Spanish, to keep people who do no harm out of the territories, that is, out of the Americas, is an act of war. Vitoria argues that the Spanish colonists can defend them against such acts of war by the Native Americans uh, by seizing their territory. So for Vitoria, a refusal to allow the immigration of Spanish colonists justifies Spanish colonization. Whether or not foreigners harm the interests of natives is to be decided by an objective standards, that is by learned persons such as Vitoria himself, and it, that's not a prerogative of the natives. Another ground for conquering the territories of the Indians is when the Indians infringe on the right to preach and announce the gospel. Vitoria argues that the Pope can and actually has entrusted the right to preach to the Spanish and the Spanish alone. And this uh, move allows him to combine a general human right to migrate with a Spanish monopoly in the Americas. A century later, in 1609, my fellow countryman uh, Hugo de Groot, um, who was a member of the political elite of the Dutch Republic, published Mare Liberum, the, the Free Sea. The core question of this pamphlet is whether the Portuguese have the right to deny the Dutch the use of the seas in the East Indies. But the Portuguese, they claimed to have this right because the Pope gave them uh, a monopoly uh, on, on that part of the globe. De Groot asserts that there is an unimpeachable rule of the law of nations, that every nation is free to travel to every other nation and to trade with it. This right to travel abroad, logically for De Groot, includes the right to go ashore and to erect buildings there, provided that this can be done without bothering others. And if this right of free trade, including the right to travel and to reside, reside is refused, that is, like for Vitoria, a legitimate ground for war. In 1625, De Groot developed a similar position in his magnum opus De Jure Belliac Pacis. Mind you, these positions were not theoretical, but they justified Dutch colonization in the East Indies, and this included the sort of acts of war that De Groot argued were legitimate. One of these was the extermination of the overwhelming majority of the approximately uh, 15,000 inhabitants of the Isle, island of Banda, uh, an estimated 1,000 were alive after this war, under the command of someone who is still a national hero in the Netherlands, Jan Pietersz Koen, in 1621. The VOC, the Dutch East India Company, then had to transfer slaves to Banda in order to restore the labor force there. It should be noted that in contrast to Vitoria, the Groot uses terminology that emphasizes the temporary character of state. This may be related to the Groot's vision of empire, which was not primarily oriented on territorial acquisition, but at maritime and mercantile supremacy. But the right to go to war, if the Groot's right of free passage was violated, made permanent occupation of vanquished ter territories justified. The Groot therefore reached a conclusion that is similar to that of Vitoria. De Groot also succeeded in combining free trade with Dutch monopoly, of course, because the, the Netherlands was a, a Protestant rebel nation. Um, he couldn't rely on the Pope. Uh, for him, for De Groot, the basis of this uh, Dutch monopoly were the treaties concluded between the Dutch uh, and monarchs in the East Indies since, since 1596. Fast forward yet another century. In 1658, the Swiss jurist Emer de Vatel published Le Droit des Gens. While for Vittoria and the Groot, colonial expansion was the primary context of Mare Liberum and De Indies, Vatel focused primarily on international law in the relation between European states. He was focused on Europe. He develops the position of Vittoria and the Groot on migration. Instead of emphasizing the right to travel, he also argues that states have a right to exclude foreigners. But if they do so, this has to be justified. 
exclusion of foreigners without justification is an abuse of this state right to exclude foreigners. If people make innocent use, that's a term uh, Vitoria use, uses, if people make innocent use of foreign territory, they are not to be excluded. The modification of the positions of Vittoria de Groot is that Vattel says that, and I quote, by virtue of its natural liberty, it is to the nation to judge whether it is or whether it's not in a position to receive this foreigner. End of quote. So while this was a prerogative of learned persons for de Groot, it has become a prerogative of uh, the, the receiving uh, country. The idea that there's a right to free trade and mobility was not only part of the justification of colonialism in general. It was also laid down specifically in some, but not all, of the treaties that were concluded in North American settler colonies, uh, in, in many that I was uh, able to, to, to find so far with the generous help of, of Amar Bhatia, who will speak later, and I really look forward to the exchange. I'm fully aware that the texts of these treaties have been written down by Europeans and that they reflect European understandings of the, of the agreements made. However, for the purposes of analyzing European perspectives on migration and international law, that is exactly what we're looking for. The 1613, right? yeah, the, the, sorry, the, the, the slide says 1603, if I remember correctly, it says 1613 treaty between Dutch settlers and Mohawk chiefs provides according to the Dutch uh, text in its first article that trade between their, between their people, or between the Mohawks and ours will be permitted as long as we participants mutually agree to this. And the treaty provided that the treaty would last forever. We participants promise to mutually maintain the above in amity and friendship for as long as the grass is green. The indigenous representation of the treaty is this uh, band with two purple strips uh, representing the Dutch boat and a Native American boat as brothers next to each other. Another reference to trade is the 1725 Boston Treaty between ind indigenous groups in New England and Nova Scotia and the British Crown. It provides that, and I quote, the Indians shall not molest any of his majesty's subjects or, or their dependents in their settlements already made or lawfully to be made, or in their carrying on their trade or other affairs. Also, after the British Crown acquired the French territories in Canada in, 16, uh, in 1763, the Royal Proclamation of 1763 stated that its subjects would benefit greatly from the increase in commerce, manufacturing and navigation that would result from this new situation, and that it would greatly contribute to speedy settling. The United States in similar treaties, um, uh, concluded similar treaties beginning, for as far as I can see, with the 1776 Treaty of Watertown between the state of Massachusetts Bay and the St. John and Micmac uh, tribe of Indians, with due apologies for sticking to the terminology uh, used in the treaty itself. The 1794 Jay Treaty between the US and the British stipulated that people from both sides could freely pass the boundary line between the two and could freely carry on trade and commerce. By mentioning free trade and free travel in one sentence, the Jay Treaty thereby relied on the notion, the same notion underlying the justification of colonialism as Victoria did. The inclusion of free trade clauses in treaties with indigenous peoples was not unique to uh, to, to North America. In the 1880s and 1890s, the British concluded a treaty with many rulers in the Niger Delta. These treaties, uh, of which the later were pre-printed, you only had to, to fill out uh, the, the name, the place, and the date, included as Article 6, uh, and I quote, the citizens and subjects of all countries may freely carry on trade in every part of the territories of the kings and chiefs party hereto, and may have houses and factories therein. This provision is, because of the houses and factories, is a precise echo of the position formulated by Hugo de Groot in 1609, but remarkably with, without stipulating a British monopoly. These treaties stipulating the right to free trade and therefore free mobility, these treaties raise two questions. The first question is, the right to trade, to free trade, was laid down in these treaties between colonizers and in indigenous population and doesn't 
such a such an article in a treaty uh, show that such a right was created by these treaties instead of a pre-existing right being codified. There are two reasons to believe that the reference to free trade were codification, that they were, to use legal jargon, declaratory and not constitutive. The first reason to think that they codify is uh, that we have seen that free trade and, and uh, was part and parcel of international law at the time, and therefore it seems logical that these treaters, treaties were not considered to create the right to free trade, but to, to codify it. Secondly, the idea was that European states uh, that were subjects of international law were concluding treaties with entities that did not qualify as such, such as Native Americans and First Nations. The question how these non-subjects of international law were nonetheless considered capable to cede their land to colonizers is one of that exceeds the scope of my talk. But this context does explain why codification was seen as useful by the Europeans. Indigenous populations might, in their uncivilized state, not have been aware of the natural law-based right to free trade and mobility, and therefore laying down this right in treaties may have been considered as a part of the civilizing mission that justified co colonialism. The second question is that the right of free trade that was used to justify colonialism is at odd with the text of these treaties, because the treaties give an exclusive trading right to the British and the United States. In these treaties, I, I, and I think the explanation for that is that in these treaties, trade is something that is uh, important from a military point of view. The monopoly on trade seeks to cut off the other party on the North American continent, the other party, the French, the, Brit the British, the US, depending on which treaty it is, it seeks to, to, to cut off a military opponent from supplies. Similarly, in the 1763 Royal Pro Pro Proclamation, settlement was permitted, but land purchase from the Indians was prohibited. Land could only be purchased by the Crown in order to end fraudulent and abusive purchases that had occurred in the past. And I quote, to the great prejudice of our interests and the great dissatisfaction of the said Indians, end of quote. This monopolistic element in a free trade discourse, of course, is, con is contradictory, but as we have seen, it is a contradiction that is typical of colonial free trade discourse. Vittoria and de Groot also combined free trade and exclusive trading rights in their work. The gradual abolition of slavery during the 19th century, and in Australia, uh, a, bit, a bit earlier, the end of the transportation of, Brit of English convicts, the end of abolition, the end of slavery led to labor force problems in the European colonies and in the new American territories in the far west. While the United Kingdom and the Netherlands in introduced indentured labor pr predominantly by people from the Ind Indian subcontinent in their colonies, the United States, for lack of colonies, could not relocate colonial subjects and attracted Chinese and later Japanese laborers. This need to attract foreign labor can explain a treaty concluded in 1868, uh, shortly after the abolition of slavery in the US, in which China and the US recognized, and I quote, the inherent and inalienable rights of man to change his home and allegiance, and also the mutual advantage of free migration and emigration of their citizens from one country to the other for the purposes of curiosity of trade or as permanent residents. And this is 1868. Again, this treaty is an articulation of the right to migrate, which reflects the spirit of Vittoria and de Graat. But this time, and that's, that's a big difference, to legitimize Chinese migration towards the American West Coast, instead of legitimizing European colonization. Nonetheless, the link with colonialism is still quite close, because Chinese migration served to implement the settler colonial um, uh, project on the West Coast. Now, to sum up so far, until the middle of the 19th century, the European position on migration and international law was unambiguous. Within Europe, migration was increasingly liberalized, in particular by lifting controls for leaving the country. And this is exemplified by the Darmstadt Chamber of Commerce welcoming the German liberalization of mobility in 1867 with the words, the entrance of foreign capital, workers and brains can only ever have positive effects on the development of a country." End of quote. 
There was a right under international law to free trade and communication, and this necessarily included the right to migrate, what Vittoria had called the Jus Peregrinandi, as long as this do did not hinder the original inhabitants. If this right was violated, Europeans could enforce it. And of course, Europeans could also enter into agreements with original inhabitants. It's obvious that the criterion that colonization should not hinder the original inhabitants was interpreted in, let's say, a highly peculiar manner by the Europeans. The continual conflicts that this led to uh, was, were the expression of a normative critique from indigenous populations. What's interesting to note, however, is that various critiques were also formulated by Europeans. Vittoria criticized Spanish atrocities in the Americas in his correspondence, while his contemporary de las Casas did so much more fundamentally and openly. As the work of Ian, uh, uh, Ian McEwen, Daniel Geiselbach, and others has shown, starting in the mid 19th century, a critique of this generally accepted right to mobility itself was developed in those parts of the settler colonies, which were the destination of Chinese indentured laborers, California and the US, British Columbia in Canada, Victoria and Australia. The success in attracting Chinese laborers led to concerns about the dominance of the white people, of the, of the white majority. This resulted in the first immigration laws aiming at restricting Chinese immigration. This is a long story, which I cut short by immediately jumping to the challenge to these Chinese exclusion laws, the, to the American Chinese exclusion laws. Uh, and these challenges, uh, these legal challenges resulted in a series of judgments of the US Supreme Court, the so-called Chinese exclusion cases. The US Supreme Court held that the power of exclusion of foreigners is an incident of sovereignty, is inherent in sovereignty. And therefore, the government is free to consider the presence of foreigners of a different race in this country who will not assimilate with us to be dangerous to its peace and security and to exclude these people on that ground. This was an abrupt and complete change of legal doctrine. Migration was not anymore the, inalien the inalienable right it has had been in 1539, in 1609, and even in 1868 but it was declared to be not a right of man at all. Quite the opposite, the right was one of states as a function of their sovereignty to control migration at will. Immigration legislation modeled on the US Chinese exclusion legislation quickly spread to states in Central and South America. And the new legal doctrine it gave rise to, asserting an absolute power of states to control migration was adopted across, across the Anglophone uh, world, although usually without an explicit reference to race. For Canada, which had introduced a prohibitive head tax for Chinese immigrants in 1885, the Chinese exclusion doctrine was adopted by the Privy Council in 1906 in Attorney General versus Kane. In this judgment, uh, the Privy Council held, and I give you a long quote, one of the rights possessed by the supreme power in every state is the right to refuse to permit an alien to enter that state, to annex what conditions it pleases to the permission to enter it, and to expel or deport from the state at pleasure, even a friendly alien, especially if it considers his presence in the state opposed to its peace, order, and good government, or to its social or material interests. And then they give two uh, references to Vatel. The court then went all on to hold that this right to expel includes, and again, I give a quote, it includes the power to do those things which must be done in the very act of, exp of expulsion, even if the right to expel is to be, ex it, sorry, it, it, the, the right to expel includes to do everything that needs to be done for expulsion, even if the right to expel is to be exercised at all, notwithstanding the fact that constraints upon the person of the alien outside the boundaries of the state or the commission of a trespass by a state officer on the territories of its neighbors should thereby result." End of quote. So this is the earliest doctrinal statement I'm aware of, of um, extraterritorial acts of dubious legality being um, um, getting a judicial blessing. Since then, or since 1906, 
this judgment has been cited as a valid precedent in, as far as I can see, eight, uh, eight Canadian Supreme Court cases. And the Canadian Supreme Court has never called into question this, uh, this doctrine. In two of these cases, the Supreme Court repeated the core of the Chinese exclusion doctrine. In the 1991 Kindler case, um, the, the Canadian Supreme Court held that the introduction of the Char Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms did not affect this doctrine, did not affect the state's power to, to include, to exclude aliens. In 2001, in the Mitchell case, uh, the Chinese exclusion doctrine was used to support the conclusion that indigenous populations in North America do not have the right to cross the US-Canadian border. This uninterrupted line of case law allows us to conclude that Attorney General versus Kane, in other words, the Canadian reception of the Chinese exclusion doctrine is still valid precedent in Canada. And the same can be said for Australia and New Zealand. Also in the US, the state of the law is as the US Supreme Court said in 1972 in Kleindienst versus Mandel, and Mandel, the Mandel here is indeed Ernest Mandel, the, the, the famous, uh, I think, Trotskyite uh, intellectual who wanted to lecture in the United States but did not get a visa. Uh, the, the, the US Supreme Court said in this case, which is a standard case, and it's uh, uh, approvingly referred to its own Chinese exclusion case, cases, the US Supreme Court held over no conceivable subject is the legislative power of Congress more complete than it is over the admission of aliens. End of quote. And as a consequence, the judicial supervision of this is, is marginal. The continuity of Chinese exclusion doctrine in settler colonial legal systems is illustrated by the use of carrier sanctions to prevent territorial contact. When I was an asylum lawyer in the 1980s, a substantial part of my clients were people who had tried to change planes at Schiphol Airport, but were refused embarkation in planes to, to, to Canada. Furthermore, the settler colony's response to boat people has been drastic. From the British Indians on the, on the Komagata Maru in 1914, via the German Jews on the St. Louis in 1939 and the Hessians in the 1990s to the Sri Lankan Tamils on the Ocean Lady in 2009 and the Afghans on the Tampa in 2011. In some for European settler colonies, such as Canada, I see an uninterrupted application of the Chinese uh, exclusion doctrine from the 1880s uh, until today. This is different for, for continental Europe. The Chinese exclusion doctrine was adopted in Britain not continental Europe, but still pretty European, in Paul versus Lord Advocate in uh, 1897. It's a case about a German fisherman in Scotland. The Court of Sessions held, and I again give you a long quote, I do not at present see how, if I had to try the question of international law, I do not see how I could hold it doubtful that by law, each nation may close its territory against the citizens of other nations to such an extent and for such a time and under such conditions as it thinks fit. Certainly no writer on the international law has, so far as I know, suggested that an alien has a right enforceable by action to enter the territory of another country. And numerous authorities were cited to the contrary. End of quote. I mean, this, is, this is massive uh, amnesia. Uh, and the, 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 the case does give uh, references to, to, to Vattel, for example, but it, it gives the usual cherry picking uh, uh, citations. Uh, at that time, however, in uh, 1897, Great Britain itself was not confronted with uh, significant migration from its colonies. Within continental Europe, the problematic to be addressed was substantially different than the issue on the table in the US and in the British Empire. In continental Europe, until the 1880s, there had, as I just said, de facto been increasingly free movement. Around that time, however, the liberal discourse and practice of free commerce and free movement began to clash with the combination of economic and political concerns. The economic concerns were about a substantial movement of proletarians in the context of an economic crisis, and at the same time, the sovereign power to refuse extradition for political crimes, and this, this element of sovereignty, the, the right not to extradite, was a cornerstone of the re European liberal idea of the state at the time. But this power to, to grant asylum, in fact, became controversial in the context of uh, left-wing political violence. <clears throat> 
In the eminent circles of the Institut du Droit International, which had been established in the 1870s, this led to, uh, this led to un uncertainty. In 1892, two, the Institut drew up rules which held that the right to refuse admission or to expel was, and I quote, a logical and necessary consequence of sovereignty, and that is pure Chinese exclusion doctrine. But at the same time, it held that admission could only be prohibited for very serious reasons, while at the same time, it held that protection of private interests or protection of national work could not be a cause for the expulsion or non-admission. And that's something that Vittoria, De Groot and Vattel would have agreed with. Whether race was an admissible ground for exclusion was also contested. In the end, a compromise was adopted holding that admission could be refused on the ground of a fundamental difference of mores or civilization. And here the code word civilization makes racism acceptable. Subsequently, World War I led to the adoption of immigration laws during the war itself throughout Europe. And later the breakdown of the pre-war European order and the revolutionary context legitimized the introduction of migration control that was, was sturdy enough to be able to control the movement of workers as well as any enemy aliens, aliens and foreign political activists, but at the same time was flexible enough so as to allow for adaptations uh, in the framework of political uh, alliances. As far as I know, in continental Europe, there was no case law legitimizing these laws in general terms. That would ha happen only much later. I ask you to forward, to fast forward one last time to 1985, to the year in which European Court of Human Rights gave its uh, Abdulaziz judgments, in which it adopted the legal doctrine developed by the US Supreme Court in its Chinese exclusion cases. In order to understand this judgment, we have to look at the European mobility regimes during and after colonization, because the, the judgment uh, came out of that context. After World War II, European colonial states were not aware that the next decades were to be about decolonization. They thought that they were reshaping their relation between metropole and colonies in the direction of a federation or a commonwealth, and independence was was far, far behind the horizon. During this process, European colonial powers granted citizenship to colonial subjects. As a consequence, citizens, including citizens of African or Asian origin, could move freely throughout the Dutch, British or French territories, including towards the metropole. The United Kingdom was the first to of the decolonizing empires to gradually undermine this free mobility regime within the Commonwealth through legislation which is adapted um, in, in piecemeal between 1962 and 1981. Gradually, free movement towards the, the UK was ended and former colonial subjects were now treated as undesirable foreigners and were subject to more restrictive migration laws than European or American nationals. Mobility, mobility rights were related to genealogy. Um, Commonwealth citizens with a parent born in the UK, in practice whites, had the right to move to, to the UK, while others, non-whites, did, did not have such a right because they were treated as immigrants. This prevented non-whites to move from African and Asian Commonwealth countries to Britain. And that was a reversal of the imperial or post-imperial free mobility regime put in place immediately after World War II. This was the context in which the case law of the European Commission and later the Court of Human Rights um, developed it fr from the 1960s. This culminated in the Abdulaziz judgment. Up, up to this day, the Abdulaziz judgment is still the standard reference for the European Court's position on migration, including asylum and human rights. The court stated that as a matter of well-established international law and subject to treaty obligations, a state has the right to control the entry of non-nationals into its territory. However, the court stated, it's not to be excluded that measures taken in the field of immigration may affect the right to respect for family life, but st states have a wide margin of appreciation in that context. The court followed the US, US Supreme Court in concluding that the exclusion of foreigners did not need justification. Quite the opposite, couples in the Abdulaziz uh, judgment was about family reunion, couples needed to justify why they preferred living in the European country where one of the spouses lived instead of in another country. 
In addition, while the court did find that UK law constituted gender discrimination for reasons that I won't go into, it did not find racial discrimination. The British legis legis legislation at stake defined white Commonwealth citizens to, uh, as nationals with a right to enter as nationals, while it defined non-white Commonwealth citizens as immigrants in need of permission to enter. Nonetheless, the court held, and I give you a quote, that the mass immigration against which the rules were directed consisted mainly of would-be immigrants from the new Commonwealth in Pakistan, and that as a, as a result they affected at the material time fewer white people than others is not a sufficient reason to consider them racist in character. It's an effect which derives not from the content of the 1980 rules, but from the fact that among those wishing to immigrate, some ethnic group, groups outnumbered others." End of quote. And the court chose to ignore that the group of those wishing to immigrate was carefully defined so that white people from the new Commonwealth and Pakistan were not part of that group, but had a right to enter as citizens. In this manner, continental Europe had now also adopted Ch the Chinese exclusion doctrine. The state has the plenary power to control migration, judicial oversight is marginal, and the undeniable racialized character of the regulation of migration has been dealt with in a manner that the European lawyers involved probably considered as rather discreet. While this legal doctrine was developed in European settler col colonies in the context of 19th century labor migration, it was only received in Europe in the context of justifying the exclusion of former colonial subjects. The added element of Abdel Aziz, like, the, of, the, like, uh, like of the Kinder ju uh, judgment, is that it adopts the Chinese exclusion doctrine as a matter of human rights law, and that gives it an added layer of legitimacy. This concludes my brief historical overview of international migration law. And now let's revisit the map. The historical overview confirms that what we see on the map is a reflection of colonial history. And as a consequence is closely related to race. Now one might object that what the, race, what, what the map shows is not so much race, but differences in wealth. And difference in wealth can arguably justify unequal access to mobility. I'm inclined to agree that the map reflects differences in wealth. However, authors as wildly diverse as Walter Rodney, Kenneth Pomeranz, Prasanan Partasarati, and Thomas Piketty have shown that the unequal international distribution of wealth is also a consequence of colonial history. The unequal distribution of wealth and of mobility are both enduring legacies of that history. What is referred to as international migration law is in fact overwhelmingly the international law of Europe and its descendants in settler colonies in North America, Australia and New Zealand. This European international migration law has developed as part of the processes of coloniz colonization and racialization. It has resulted and continues to result today in a right of Europeans and their descendants to travel across the world why pe people from South America, Africa, and Asia do not have that right. Between the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century alone, at least 62 million Europeans actually used this right to migrate. This was not just free migration. Many Europeans were forced to populate the colonies by the state or by poverty, by their class position. At the other end of the spectrum, but as part of the same story, um, as of the same history, there is the unfree migration of racialized enslaved people, both in the transatlantic slave trade and in the East Indies. An estimated 12 and a half million, million people were moved forcibly in the transatlantic slave trade. And in this context, an observation of Anne Stoller and Frederick Cooper is particularly relevant, namely that Europe itself, and here very concretely, the case law of the European Code of Human Rights is made by its imperial projects concretely the Chinese exclusion doctrine, as much as the reverse, as much as the co colonized regions were shaped by Europe. We can only understand the history of international migration law as well as its presence, if we see its intimate relation with colonialism and race. The German academic Daniel Thum concludes that international migration law is based on a fundamental normative assumption of sedentarism, 
while the Dutch academic Bas Schotel and the Belgian colleague Marie Benedict Amour have used the more argumentative terms exclusion without justification and Strasbourg reversal. Their analyses are not historical, but restate today's state of affairs. It will come as no surprise that this sedentarist approach, which formally dominates the legal doctrine in the Global North, is shared by states and regional organizations in the Global North, such as the European Union. However, academic work also takes this Global North approach to constitute international migration law. In textbooks, the Global North approach is considered as inherent in the very notion of state sovereignty. By doing this, academic work ignores the colonial origins of international migration law and naturalizes its racialized character. I now want to uh, 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 turn to the second part of my talk, which addresses non-European perspectives interna in international migration law. Regional case law in Africa and the Americas does not necessarily accept the global north sedentarist legal doctrine. Legal actors there do not find it obvious that the unequal legal mobility regime that we see on the map sits easily with international law. A first example of a different approach can be found in the case law of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which supervises the American Convention on Human Rights, to which, as I understand it, Canada, like the US, is not a party. We saw that at the beginning of the 20th century, South American countries rapidly adopted the Chinese exclusion doctrine and the racialized legislation that it legitimized. Diego Acosta has shown that towards the end of the 20th century, migration in South America has a fundamentally different structure compared to the earlier period. Migration law, sorry, has in South America has a fundamentally different structure. The earlier tradition of openness towards nationals of other South American countries, which continued, interacted with the, con with the continent turning from a destination uh, 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 region for European settlers to a region of origin of migrants headed for North America. This may help to explain that the Inter-American Court has ruled that equality and non-discrimination are peremptory norms of international law, also known as just Kogans, and this means that equality and non-discrimination are norms from which no derogation is permitted, no exceptions can be made. Secondly, the Inter-American Court lists migration status, that is having or not having a residence right, as a prohibitive discrimination ground. The court points out that this does not mean that states cannot make any distinction between nationals and non-nationals or between documented and undocumented migrants. In other words, states can make migration laws, but exclusion requires justification. The Inter-American Court requires that such distinctions are reasonable, objective, proportionate, and that they are not discriminatory and do not harm human rights. Similarly, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights holds that the expulsion of foreigners may violate the right to property, the right to work, the right to education, the right to family life, the right to equality, the right to effective remedy, as well as the prohibitions of mass expulsion and reformat. Only after addressing these issues, it acknowledges that states can take legal action against undocumented migrants. The position of the African Commission can be also can also be related to African history. Various authors may mention three elements that may help explain this position. First, traditions of mobility, which make the Chinese exclusion doctrine implausible in Africa. Second, a lack of control of many African states over their borders. And third, the arbitrariness of African borders, which are largely a colonial uh, heritage. These African and American supervisory, these African and inter-American supervisory bodies interpret human rights treaties of which, for our purposes, the text does not differ substantially from the European Convention on Human Rights or the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. These African and American supervisory bodies have an equal claim to formulate international law as the European Court of Human Rights does, but they take a fundamentally different starting point to international migration law by putting the burden of justification for exclusion with states, instead of, as Strasbourg does, of putting this, the burden of justification for non-exclusion with individuals. They apply, uh, the, the African and inter-American uh, courts apply uh, human rights law as it is applied also by states 
courts and doctrine in the global north in any other field except migration law. Now, of course, not all, cor all courts in the global south are inclined to take such an approach. They do not all have the same position and there are different political and normative visions within the global south. By way of example, Libyan human rights activists have litigated against the Memorandum of Understanding between Italy and Libya of 2017, which is instrumental in Europe's offshore policy. These activists succeeded in getting the MOU suspended by the appeals court in Tripoli, but then subsequently on appeal, the Libyan Supreme Court used a construction similar to the one used by the EU Court of Justice in the humanitarian visa case to declare itself not competent to hear the case. And so they could not give an injunction. So courts, states, regional organizations and academics in the Global South may and at times do express support for the sedentarist approach to international migration law that I have labeled as typical for the Global North. Simply think of the mass expulsions which led to this case law of the African Commission of Human and People's Rights that I refer to. Reversely, there's critique within the Global North. An example could be the Hirsi Jama judgment of the European Court of Human Rights, which did limit state sovereignty. So location does not, uh, does not determine legal doctrine. And there is a reifying tendency of the kind of analysis that I'm making here. And that's something that deeply that, that worries me. But at the same time, it cannot be ignored that, for example, many state officials, judges and academics in Africa have different normative responses to the visa, to the visa map I showed a few minutes ago than their colleagues in Europe. If one stops to sideline the positions from the global south, the normative pluralism, the normative disagreement is hard to ignore. In addition, not all countries in the global north have the same position. An example of this is that Canada convinced the US to agree to a safe third country agreement in 2002, a concession of the US to Canada, which as Obi Okafor and Audrey Mecklen have shown, uh, Canada acquired in connection with Canada's cooperation with the US's post 9-11 security policies. This allows Canada to benefit from the at times extreme UN, US asylum policies and, and, and migration policies, while at the same time allowing, in, 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 while at the same time Canada allows itself to continue in Obi Okafor's words, its national self image of a remarkably or even unusually human and inclusive country. A case exemplifying the unrealized potential for a fundamentally different approach within a global north legal system is the Canadian Supreme Court case of Grand Chief Michael Mitchell against the Minister of National Revenue. I think this case shows a position that I have reductively labeled as global south. It's something like a global south perspective within a global north legal system. In this case, Mitchell claimed that trading and mobility rights across the St. Lawrence River, which since 1783 constitutes the international US-Canada border, that's a, a, a clarification more for myself than for the North Americans in the audience, but Mitchell claimed that these mobility and trading rights um, uh, are a continuation of a, a pre-colonial practice of the Mohawks to which he belongs. For the Canadian Supreme Court, the central question is whether such trade and travel can be considered as a modern practice that is a continuation of practices that existed prior to colonization. And also, it's, the central question is whether this practice is defining of and integral to the distinctive culture of the Mohawks. The court concludes that Mitchell has not established that, there's a, that there is an ancestral practice of transporting goods across the St. Lawrence River for the purposes of trade. Furthermore, the court finds that even if it were accepted that such an ancestral practice did exist, it has not been established that the practice of transporting goods across the St. Lawrence River was a defining feature of Mohawk culture or that it was integral to the Mohawks. And such geographical specificity is seen by the court as essential because general trading rights, and this is a quote, general trading rights lack an inherent connection to a specific tract of land, end of quote. Thus, it seems that the Mohawks found the right to trade and to travel as obvious as Vitoria and the Groot. 
However, the Canadian Supreme Court responds with a test whether there was an ancestral right to trade in this particular location. If the claims of Vitoria and de Groot had been considered as equally limited in geographical scope, this would undermine the current title, the current, the present day title of the descendants of European set settlers to land in North America. And that's apparently an irony that the Supreme Court of Canada uh, misses. In Anthony Engie's terms, the court relies on the dynamic of difference. A European right is a general one, while the indigenous right, if it exists at all, is a specific one. In other words, Europeans can go places and Mohawks can go where it was a defining feature of their pre-colonial culture to go. Nonetheless, the Mitchell case is of interest because it could be considered as articulating an indigenous claim to mobility across colonial borders created by Europeans on their land. And such a claim has evident parallels with similar, cla similar claims made in West Africa. I'm fully aware that in the globalizing kind of analysis that I make here, I barge into foreign territory, such as historical and current Canadian case law. I honestly try to make innocent use of my virtual presence at uh, York University, but I guess that we have seen so far um, that such a claim uh, wa uh, warrants healthy suspicion, such a claim to innocent use. Uh, I'm all the more grateful for the honor of holding this lecture and for the opportunity it provides to exchange with researchers in Canada and I'm also grateful for the, for the sheer hospitality. I will stop sharing my screen and end my slideshow. The different interpretations of international human rights law from courts in the global south is overwhelmingly ignored in the global north. In academic work, two legal doctrines from the global south case law, legislation, ac academic writings, it's mostly often simply not registered. It doesn't, it's not registered that it, that it exists. And to the extent it's noted, it's seen, it's seen as being of purely local relevance. This is again, what Anthony Engie has called the dynamic of difference. This tendency to equate the global North with the universal, the abstract and the general, and the global South with the specific, the concrete and the local is, and I'm afraid I cannot find a friendlier term, is colonial. And my intention is not to criticize particular authors or journals. The, ob the ob observation that international migration law has a colonial structure is a critique of the field of which I myself have been part for decades and it applies as much to myself as to others. To sum up, colonialism and as a consequence race is a central element of international migration law. I hesitate a bit what an appropriate metaphor would be. Race is part of the grammar of the deep structure of our field. It's what, part of what makes it possible. Without colonialism and race, immigration, international migration law would not exist. We would not, would not be able to formulate utterances about migration law. And this is as much the case today as it was in 1539. And like in 1539, this is contested in particular by legal actors on the receiving end of the, result, the resulting inequality. I don't want to pretend that race is the only part of this grammar, of this deep structure. I've already hinted at the cl close relation between colonialism and class by referring to the crucial role of labor. And I think this needs further reflection in the foot footsteps of materialist social scientists like Saskia Sassen and Nicolas de Genova. Another crucial element of the field is gender. Reproduction of the population and racial mixture have been themes in international migration law from the very beginning. Vittoria addresses the, the, the issue. In her work on family and, my, uh, fam, on, on family and the nation, Sarah van Walsen, a Dutch Canadian uh, academic, has analyzed the ongoing influence of colonial gender dynamics in contemporary family reunion, uh, asylum, and labor migration law. So, what? Shall we conclude that all this is very unjust? To be honest, I think it's hard to say anything else. As Thomas Piketty has remarked more broadly, contemporary inequality is strongly and powerfully structured by the system of borders, nationalities, and the related social and political rights. However, I'm not sure where the mere conclusion of illegitimacy brings us. Colleagues with similar concerns to mine have proposed the notion of border justice. But that seems problematic because, as we have seen, the injustice of borders is not marginal. 
how can the borders between the global north and the global south be just without much more comprehensive forms of justice? But then alternatively, doesn't this suggest that, uh, that an ideal of no borders or of open borders should be adopted? There's a similar problem to that. Without comprehensive forms of global justice, open borders may lead to undercutting social standards in social democracies. And that is why the idea of open borders is so dear to the editors of The Economist and The Wall Street Journal. As someone from a Northern European social democracy, identifying with that egalitarian tradition, maybe I don't have the distance needed to think beyond this dilemma. I do find the suggestion of Tendai Achuma very inspiring, where she acknowledges the right of a community control access, but then redefines the community that has this right as a transnational communities with post-colonial ties, bringing together former colonies and metropoles. However, policies of the global north are currently expanding and reinforcing the exclusion of Asians, Africans, and Latinos without justification. They do so not merely by making entry requirements more, strict, more, more stringent, but also by intensifying externalization. And as Chimney has observed, the global compacts on migration and refugees can be seen as efforts of the global north to make countries in the global south, as well as international organizations and civil society, speak its language and adopt the Chinese exclusion legal doctrine. The compacts can be seen, in other words, as hegemonic projects. And on the basis of the analysis I propose, it does make sense to object to such hegemonic projects, which are based on ignoring and sidelining perspectives from the global south. But also I want to emphasize that my critique is first and foremost methodological. If international law claims to be international, it cannot, it cannot, in the words of Ashum Bembi, make generalizations from idioms of provincialism. Of course, it's true that in this manner, it becomes clear that legal methodology is inseparable from politics. But because the focus of my critique is methodological, so is my response. And that response is that in plain and simple words, as researchers and educators in the global north, we need to begin taking sources from the global south seriously. Legislation, case law, state practice, academic writings from the global south, they all have to be conceptualized as sources of international law and not as atavistic exoticisms. This also means that the history of international migration law should include, for example, the Native American, Ottoman, Mughal, Arab and Chinese leg legacies. For unwritten legal traditions, innovative research me methods may have to be adopted, uh, such as those suggested by Judge Rear Mountry in the Hungary versus Slovakia judgment. Or think of the Oath of Manden, a 13th century human rights catalogue from the Mali Empire. In addition, the colonial structure of international law makes it necessary to include the legal regulation of slavery and the slave trade in our, into our field. This is partly for historical reasons. The slave trade was large scale, economically induced forced migration, but also including the legal history of slavery would allow for understanding indentured labor in its continuity with slavery. In today's Europe and elsewhere, work in the meat, meat processing, sex work, agriculture, and domestic work share, share many characteristics with what we call indentured labor. In settler colonies such as Canada, I think that migration law can include facing the, and it, as a guest, it feels a bit impolite to say, but facing the annihilation of the original inhabitants of this territory in which the Jus Peregrinandi, as applied in actual practice, played a key role. If you face that history, and if you face the, 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 the present day consequences of that, what does that imply for current uh, day migration law, which denies the Jus Peregrinandi? Is there a debate in Canada about honoring Canadian treaty obligations about the US Peregrinandi? I look forward to learning more about that during the discussion. I would like to end with some concrete ideas about how as academics we can face and take up the challenges inherent in acknowledging, in acknowledging the colonial presence uh, of presence of migration, uh, uh, the presence of coloniality in, my, in international migration law. Some ideas. Now we have figured out how to do our teaching online, we may wonder how we can develop truly global curricula for global audiences. This would inherently require reconsidering the Eurocentric uh, content of our curricula, which is a good idea anyway, and it would require close cooperation with our colleagues in the Global South, among others, so as not to undermine their position in the process. <laughs>
Also, those of us who play a role in publishing as editors or reviewers can reconsider our policies and our practices so as to figure out how they and how, in fact, we can be so exclusive and so excluding uh, two voices from the global south. As fundraisers and funders, we should make every effort to get more funding for, ind for independent academic research in our field for our colleagues in the global south. When organizing conferences, we can ask ourselves whether it's really necessary to have them in places which are inaccessible to our colleagues from the global south, both because of the costs and because they're likely to be refused visa. And while we, by all means, keep complaining about how terrible it is that due to COVID, we're unable to get on planes every, uh, every so often so as to hold to have, have talks in Toronto, we might consider that online events allow for the participation of colleagues from places we may have never heard of and who may change, enrich or disturb our discussions in ways that we cannot currently imagine. I'm aware that I suggest to engage in piecemeal change while the problem is fundamental and structural. And there's something unsatisfactory about that because these small responses seem to be of a different scale than the problem. But then on the upside, this does have the advantage of thinking about concrete steps, which we can make in our daily work. That's where I want to end and I look very much, I'm looking forward very much to the, to, to the next challenge. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Thomas, for your uh, your presentation um, that takes us through uh, a centuries of of uh, jurisprudence on um, international migration issues and invites us to uh, think about um, perspectives uh, that are uh, excluded from uh, some of that jurisprudence. Invites us to rethink uh, some of the foundational. Uh, norms or the norms that we uh, present uh, in contemporary uh, sites uh, as uh, foundational. So thank you so much for that um, uh, presentation. Uh, now uh, we're going to hear from uh, two uh, discussants before we open uh, up the floor uh, to uh, questions uh, from the audience. Our first discussant is uh, Idil Atak. Uh, Idil and I had a conversation just before the um, uh, before the meeting began uh, about uh, how I would uh, introduce her, uh, and the reason we needed to have that uh, conversation is that the institution um, that she's uh, based uh, at is going through uh, some challenges right now uh, around um, the institution's uh, name. Uh, so she's at a university uh, that is named uh, after. Um, Egerton Ryerson. Um, uh, Ryerson uh, was one of the architects of the residential school system in Canada that has been uh, characterized quite uh, rightly uh, as a, a form of genocide against uh, Indigenous uh, peoples with uh, ongoing uh, devastating uh, uh, impacts. And so many um, faculty members and students at the university have raised objections to the name, have uh, suggested that uh, the name be uh, changed. Uh, and in the meantime, many scholars are referring to themselves as scholars uh, based at X University. So uh, Idil is um, uh, an associate professor at uh, X uh, University. Uh, she uh, is um, based in uh, the Department of, Cri of Criminology. Uh, but cross-appointed uh, with the new um, Lincoln Alexander uh, School of Law uh, at uh, the university. She's an expert um, in uh, irregular migration and uh, human rights, in uh, refugee protection in Canada and Europe, in securitization, in uh, international and European immigration law, and in uh, human rights law uh, more uh, generally. So, uh, Idil, uh, over to you. Thanks a lot, Sean, um, for this um, introduction and for the invitation. Um, I am also a big fan of Thomas's work. Um, so I would like to thank you for the opportunity to comment uh, on um, your presentation today. Um, the global inequality of mobility is a very pressing issue and the pandemic has exacerbated it. Uh, I'm thinking of asylum seekers uh, who can't access protection due to travel restrictions. 
Uh, I'm also thinking of delays and barriers in resettlement processes uh, that we experience in Canada. Um, this morning, we heard uh, media reports about um, refugees pleading with Ottawa to bring their children and spouses from Gaza, for example. Um, and as you show, um, this unequal distribution of wealth and mobility, wealth and mobility are both legacies of a history shaped by colonialism and racism. Um, if I refer to my example of uh, asylum seekers and refugees, we know that the vast majority of uh, these population um, are from the global south and they are racialized. Uh, so your analysis is very timely and very thought provoking. I agree with you that uh, the way the international migration law is studied and understood is very Eurocentric. The codification of the right to migrate is not specific to Europe uh, and mobility relating to free trade, uh, communication has shaped civilizations across the globe for centuries. Uh, I was thinking of a novel I read recently um, um, and entitled in an, in an Antique Land by Amitav Ghosh um, that reconstructs the history of a 12th century uh, Jewish merchant um, based in Egypt and uh, move, he moved to India for trade and for personal reasons as well. And it's a really beautiful story of migration that documents that there were treaties and agreements in place. Um, as you said, and they were not limited to Europe or to European expansion. And I agree with you that instructors and researchers have a responsibility to challenge the Eurocentric conceptualization of the international migration law, uh, given that such conceptualization uh, led to colonial expansion and also it rationalizes mechanisms that restrict the mobility of millions of individuals currently. Um, you outline how migration was a right, and then um, in the 19th century, there was a shift um, that we still experience toward exclusionary policies, um, this Chinese exclusion doctrine. Um, the limitation of the right to mobility has been done in the name of sovereignty, um, which is closely connected to various rationales, such as the nation building process, citizenship, who belongs in the community. Um, and there is a rich body of literature, as you mentioned it, studying racism and immigration, not only from a historical perspective, but also um, in its contemporary manifestations and in its multiple interactions with colonialism, class, gender, and other markers of differentiation. Um, I read recently an article by Cecilia Menhivar, um, and, and she says that immigration policies function through colorblind racism. Uh, they create subtle yet powerful racialization in immigration practices today. Um, and in fact, literature shows that racialization results in differentiated treatment of particular groups of migrants, um, uh, but on, not only, and in policies that exclude and target them. Um, if I may refer to Provin and Dori, um, in an article they published in 2011, they refer to the combination of increased surveillance and sanctions. Um, and I quote them, they, uh, that produce an immigrant other whose continued presence is increasingly perceived as um, dangerous for the security and integrity of the nation, unquote. Um, and in fact, um, researchers across the global north um, but also um, in the global south, of course, have documented the role of the criminalization of migration as part of what you call the Chinese exclusion um, doctrine and its lingering effects. And I'm wondering where the criminal law fits uh, in your analysis. Um, Another point I would like to make, I noticed um, your call for greater engagement between the European Court of Human Rights and the other regional human rights courts, namely the African Court and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, um, because they are more progressive, less colonial in their approach to equality and non-discrimination, as you explain it, uh, because also um, these um, courts in Africa, in, in America, um, require the state to justify exclusion. Um, and, and this is really interesting since, since you show how colonialism and racism can influence the case law and result in significant differences in the interpretation of, of, of similar provisions. 
um, by the different um, regional human rights treaty bodies. At the same time, these regional courts are the products of the human rights doctrine that has prevailed after the Second World War. Um, the American and the African courts, um, if I'm correct, are modeled on the European Court of Human Rights. Um, so I was wondering what is the influence of the international human rights law on migration law? I know it's a pretty broad <laughs> topic, um, but is it something that exacerbates um, the colonial and racist tendencies within migration law, or is it um, something that would rather advocate for greater mobility? And in Europe, um, in both the Luxembourg Court and the Strasbourg Court question and sometimes limit the state sovereignty when it comes to migrants' um, um, exclusions. Um, and for example, long-term residents, some um, third country nationals have greatly benefited from, from the case law, progressive case law, family reunification, social rights, um, also have been um, um, benefited from, from this um, progressive interpretation by the European courts. So there have been some positive and significant developments in challenging exclusionary migration policies um, by these courts. Um, I think this is cause for cautious optimism, uh, but an area that remains fundamentally problematic in my opinion is um, the protection of refugees and asylum seekers today. Um, we see a proliferation of exclusion mechanisms which aim to delegitimize the protection needs of um, um, migrants, racialized migrants, um, and, and treating them as economic undocumented migrants. We refer to Hirsi Jamal case by the European Court of Human Rights. This is a good example. Um, so the impact of colonialism and, and racism in refugee law, um, I think it, it, it is something that is really uh, worth looking further at when we discuss the mobility rights. Um, so I very much welcome your analysis. Um, in this respect. And finally, in terms of the way forward, um, I, I noticed that you're rather skeptical concerning the global compacts uh, for migration and on refugees. You remind us that they can be seen as hegemonic uh, projects. Um, the global compact for migration um, can also be considered as a step towards facilitating human mobility for all, not only for um, uh, you know a small portion of the um, um, population, but for all, because it provides a list of uh, the changes um, required in both policy and practice to meet the, um, the policy objective, which is the facilitate, facilitating human mobility. Um, and also there is some effort to, uh, in terms of structuring states' responses more coherently within the Global Compact for Migration. Um, so um, I, I will end by um, raising the question, if the Global Compacts are not the right tools, um, I was wondering what form the international efforts uh, beyond our efforts within the ac academic world should take to promote the fundamental rights to mobility in a more ju um, just and equitable manner. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Idil. Um, uh, we're going to hear from our second uh, discussant, and then I'll give uh, Thomas an opportunity to uh, say a few words if, if you would like. Uh, so our next uh, discussant is Amar Bhatia. Uh, Amar is uh, one of my colleagues at uh, Osgood Hall Law School at York University. He's also one of the uh, faculty uh, members, uh, one of the York faculty who are connected with the Center for uh, Refugee Studies. Uh, he brings uh, expertise, uh, really one of the leading uh, thinkers uh, in Canada on the intersection between um, uh, Indigenous law um, and uh, uh, migration. Uh, law is a particular interest in um, uh, transnational uh, migration uh, connected uh, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, work. Uh, he also, uh, if that's not enough, uh, has uh, expertise uh, in uh, property law uh, and in uh, uh, community uh, lawyering. So, uh, Amar, uh, over to you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, uh, well, yeah, thank you again for inviting me to discuss the paper. Um, 
and thank you for sharing it uh, the draft with uh, with us in advance thomas um and also thank you to adil for the chance to hear your response uh, too so there were two points i wanted to address in my time today uh, the first one was footnotes and the other one is freedom uh, first the footnotes um, although i'm starting with your paper these comments are directed more broadly as I think and know they represent wider methodological currents in our fields about, as you said, taking sources seriously, whether that's critical migration studies, migration law, or international migration law. For instance, while you note that it's important not to look at the written versions of treaties uh, alone, this appears to be what the paper um, is doing. After reading and rereading it, um, it seemed to be the case to me that there was not an indigenous scholar cited in the footnotes or referenced in the body. And while indigenous leaders and facts and historical events and names are mentioned, and even the 2001 Mitchell decision from the Supreme Court of Canada, there were no indigenous scholars or theories mentioned here. Um, unfortunately, this reminded me of what John Burroughs has written on the Mitchell decision, how Chief Mitchell's ample trial evidence and testimony on Mohawk cross-border mobility and trade across the St. Lawrence River was largely disappeared from the federal court and the Supreme Court of Canada, because it was seen to be sparse, doubtful, and equivocal, because they could not in the end convince the court of the trustworthiness of indigenous knowledge. Um, we are clearly capable of immense research capacity in our field, but for some reason continue to fall short on these issues, as I have seen in repeated articles that review uh, the intersection of migration and indigenous studies. Even though there is a demonstrably wide deep, broad, long list of indigenous scholars writing in English and other European languages on the topics of migration, mobility, and membership on borders, constitutions, and courts, and on knowledge production, research ethics, and reciprocity. I'm not saying these things to be rude or inhospitable, uh, even though I'm reminded I'm not the host here, something we settlers too often and easily forget again and again, but because I feel responsible to say them as a non-Indigenous person trying to be a good guest on stolen lands. And I'm relying on the work of Ruth Colazar Green and Sujit Savior here, that we can no longer proceed in this way. Uh, I think it's long past time that uh, we, we stop taking a path of least resistance that reads non-European approaches to international migration law as what emanates from courts and regional bodies. Uh, and I think this unfortunately still domesticates Indigenous peoples and nations and permits us to divide what is international migration law, or as you have just shown, and McEwen and Radhika Monja have noted, uh, is actually inter-European settler colonial state law about Chinese and Indian exclusion that masquerades as international migration law. So if we take this domesticating approach, it, uh, it traverses us from indigenous legal orders that are the sources of authority for these treaties for the places not covered by the treaties with imperial and settler sovereigns, and frankly, uh, in the indigenous laws that are the source of authority for everything else here, since indigenous legal orders cover the original sources of all wealth, the lands and labor, both productive and socially reproductive, as Federici, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Adrian Smith, and many others have noted. Ultimately, your paper takes us on a compelling and important journey across time, space, continents, court cases, policy decisions, and doctrines. And they all seem tied together by the golden thread of white supremacy. To conclude that colonialism and race are central elements of international migration law. But I think we already knew this, um, and not just the migrants and refugees, the descendants of transatlantic slavery, the displaced and dispossessed, but even uh, once or twice removed academics, armchair activists, or otherwise. So um, what now? In terms of methodological interventions and taking Southern sources seriously, I think at the very least, we can no longer just cite what's familiar because it more easily fits our existing paradigms or shows only what the Europeans were thinking, albeit in order to critique those same Europeans. Because the truth is those Europeans were using indigenous protocols and devices like wampum belts to voice and conduct themselves sometimes in indigenous languages according to indigenous legal orders and relations and on indigenous lands. As noted in the wampum at now, Niagara piece by John Burroughs, uh, which is not mentioned here, um, these protocols were followed. And even when we're looking at the uh, Turo Wampum, the Guswenta, um, the, the purple rows were mentioned, but the white rows were not. And these are equally important uh, within that treaty relationship, standing for peace, friendship, and respect. So if the written version of a treaty is all that remains, or if there was never a written version to begin with, 
I don't think we can simply say that what's left over is the European mindset. And that's somehow still um, interesting in its own right because it's been subsequently so determinative through European and settler courts. Part of that may be true, but it's also true because the European mindset has erased the trace of indigenous authority that informed the relationship and smuggled rights in place of the responsibilities that should pertain here, sometimes literally stealing the wampum belts in some cases. So I think we need to avoid reinforcing these patterns of erasure in our work. Still, if your paper, or if I can be so bold, our work generally as critical migration or international migration law scholars was full of these kinds of references that I just mentioned, we might still end up at the same place and recommendations that you have mentioned. Local ones, modest, piecemeal, but also achievable ones that take in uh, concrete steps of our daily work. Uh, steps like curricular content reform, uh, Zooming, publishing, funding, <clears throat> and conferencing in the Global South, or with Global Southerners, both geographically and metaphorically. However, I do not think that this endpoint or even starting point um, can be sufficient in part because as you have said, the challenges that we face in the communities we work with or for or on behalf of, and there are several books you could write on the differences in those phrases, uh, ranging from solidarity to saviorism. The challenges that these communities face are not merely piecemeal or local or modest or academic in the sense of things contained with what we tenured academics can do to fulfill our teaching, research, and service requirements. So um, I'm gonna turn now from footnotes to the freedom I chose the word freedom because I thought it sounded nice with footnotes to use another F word. Um, but I think what I really mean here is individual and collective self-determination. I'm relying on the work of Leanne Batasamasake Simpson on individual and collective free determination, Ronaldo Walcott on the abolition of the prison industrial complex and the thingification of property, Tendai Yachiyemi, who you mentioned on decolonial migration, Carmen Gonzalez on migration as reparations for racial capitalism and climate displacement, Harsha Walia on the border politics as refusal and reparations that do not simultaneously erase indigenous resistance and Adam Gedichu on world making. I think if we've learned and reconfirmed the lessons that migration law, or as your paper and the work of others has shown to be inter-European settler colonial Chinese and Indian migration exclusion that originates in indigenous slavery, is fixed by transatlantic black slavery until abolition and is then patched by Chinese and Indian indentured migration law, then our work needs to move with and be accomplice to and conspire to breathe together following Habtum and Scribe's work with communities and social movements organizing against white supremacy, patriarchy and capitalism all at the same time and in cross-national solidarities. As the authors that I've mentioned highlight, this means organizing for individual and collective self-determination that includes fulsome mobility in the wake of the debts that have been accrued by Northern and Western imperial and settler colonial states over the centuries through indigenous lands and hands, through black lands and hands, and through brown lands and hands. Migration as decolonization, as reparations, as abolition, I think these all work to the individual and collective self-determination where we can all move forward together. From what I read and seen and heard, this requires reworking um, towards different notions of how we care for one another, human and non-human relations, and what our economies look like. These different visions mean moving forward together through space and time, whether staying in place or moving across borders, and not just in fleeting moments of spectacular violence, but across entire generations for lasting individual and collective free determination. Drawing on Simpson's work and Donis Minwanako Gizhigo Kennedy's work, one of the most ordinary things you can do to be with your children and grandchildren over time, including adop adoptive parenting of non-biological children in the Anishinaabe sense following Damien Lee, and really all those kin who we love more than ourselves, to be with them is one of the most radical things we can do. And it's something that serves indigenous black and brown families and communities. And I think this point also overlaps with Walcott noting that black people have been policed from the plantation straight through to the present moment including black and slave people being denied the legal status of family and instead passing on to their children an inherited status of private property. So as the mass graves of indigenous children in Kamloops and of black families in Tulsa have shown, as the mass killings in Quebec and London of Muslim families praying and simply walking on the sidewalk makes dark, as the invisibilized deaths of migrant workers in Southwestern Ontario and Alberta, and their even less visible surviving family members abroad punctuate, 
the state and police killings and incarceration and child removals and drug overdoses and deaths of our elders and evictions of tenants and encampments all underscore, not just here, but across the world in Kashmir and the Philippines and Xinjiang and Palestine, being able to freely integrate your loved ones into the heart of your work and life and to do so across generations is no small feat. And these values are especially pertinent in the context of migration, where a shared dilemma of landlessness must be solved by cooperation for mutual sustenance. Especially when white supremacists and capitalist states and societies are themselves conspiring together against this very simple and radical act of being together over the centuries and at all times. I think that this counter domestication and counter -thingification, uh, thingification should be the metric of our scholarship. Uh, obviously, these words are responding to wider themes and currents than what's contained in one paper, but I wanted to say them because I'm sad, I'm angry, but I'm also hopeful that they hold some truth for what we say we are trying to do here about methodology, sources, and anti colonial work. Um, thank you again for the chance to hear your thoughts in progress uh, and to share some of mine. Thank you very much, uh, Amar, for your uh, for your thoughts, for your your intervention there. Uh, I did want to uh, offer uh, Thomas uh, an opportunity. If if you would like to say anything in response to anything that uh, Yadil or uh, Amar has uh, said, um, uh, obviously there's there's lots there, and you can't uh, hope to uh, respond to everything. But if you would like to take a moment, um, feel free to do so. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I want to respond to to both by uh, discussing um, by, by 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 raising one one issue, and then I'll be happy to hear uh, more from to, to to hear more to li to listen more. Um, it's um, I I mean a common uh, approach to, 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 to international law, international human rights law, migration, refugee law, is to see it as a tool to, uh, to, to improve the position of people in, in, in bad, bad, bad positions. Um, I, I don't share that. I find, find that uh, too, too optimistic. Um, I, and be, because I think it's, it's, a, it's a tool that works much better for the powers that be than for people in weak positions because the, the, the law uh, reproduces the, the weak position of, of people in weak positions, as, as you see, illustrated very well in, in, in international migration law. Um, and so the, the, the alternative that I, that, that, I, that I take, the approach that I take is to see international migration law as a field of contestation, as one of the, one of the, the, one of the arenas in which the conflict uh, between, um, uh, between Eurocentrism and um, uh, post and decolonial uh, struggles plays out. So it, it's, 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 it's an arena, it's, 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 it's one of the scenes on which, the, which this happens. Um, and we, in this, the, the, the power differences that are at the heart of the conflict are reproduced. So some, some parties are stronger than others. That means that as an academic, I'm also part of that scene. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not outside of the, of the, of the field that I uh, uh, work in, but I'm, I'm part of the same thing. And there I have, I have a very clear position. I'm a global north uh, uh, academic. Why you call me out on that? Thank you, because that, that, that's very pertinent. Uh, so I'm, I'm, we are all situated in this, in this, in this arena, in this, in, in this, in this conflict. Um, um, and uh, what I'm trying to do is to, um, um, in, in the Foucauldian image, like we're all chained, we, but we, what we can do is to rattle our chains a bit, but then the way in which we rattle reproduces. Uh, our position. Nevertheless, I think rattling the chain is 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 uh, can make some sense. Um, and um, so, and 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 the 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 the, the tendency in, in my in the paper that I just presented of domesticating uh, global south or indigenous approaches is present. And so I I, I value it if if that's if that's if you point it out and I'll try to work it, but it's, it's not something, uh, I think we're not, not, not able to, to, uh, to, to, to escape our, our, our situatedness. And the dilemma, the, the thing that, that I'm negotiating daily is, is how to not make this into a shallow excuse to, uh, to do the usual uh, European uh, uh, thing. So, 
So thanks for entering in that, into that discussion. And it's also it's also a response to, to Edil's comment on like, isn't there, there positive stuff sometimes? I'm a bit more pessimistic than you on, on both European courts. But yeah, sure, it's, 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 it's one of the arenas where, where the conflict plays out. And sometimes there, there, there are good things. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, okay, so we've got uh, about 20 minutes, uh, 15 minutes, I guess, for um, uh, questions. If anyone in the audience would like to pose a question, uh, you can use the raise hand function in Zoom. Uh, if that's not uh, working uh, for you, you can um, uh, indicate that you'd like to pose a question in the, uh, uh, in the chat. So does it, would anyone like to pose a question? Uh, Nergis. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for this uh, very um, engaging and very important discussion and also the discussants' comments. Um, my question is, is a bit of a challenge um, in the sense that um, I am a Toil scholar myself, or so I identify. But um, there is the presumption that with the global um, South North alliance and solidarity building, um, if the hand is extended to the global south, then the scholars and the activists and the experts will readily engage. And I, I think we, we've got to ask further questions about the, the presumption that just the extension of the hand itself <clears throat> will cover the mileage. And I think Amar's commentary um, might be touching on a similar point of view. When there are very wretched long histories and backgrounds. Um, there might have to be um, original steps of reconciliation before working together is actually a possibility. So I'm just wondering, uh, our speaker could actually comment on that. Can you repeat the, and, and expand a bit on the question because there were connection problems? So I'm, I'm not sure I, I, I got what you wanna 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 discuss. Okay, um, so so I am from the global south, but I also work in the global north. For three decades, it's very common as a problem that someone who has a grant from Europe or from North America comes to global south, identifies partners, and expects people to jump on the on the bandwagon. And I think that's on its own a problem because there are very long histories of inequality and exclusion. I think that presumption, the 12 uh, methodology that we just naturally include them and they come on board is questionable. Um, there, there, there are still problems. So if it, please stop me if, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I get off track. Um, When, 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 um, in, in the cooperation, in, 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 the, in, the, in the, 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 the meeting of uh, uh, an academic like myself and colleagues from the Global South, um, that is also a, a meeting that is structured by, 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 the, by the inequality. Um, so it's, it's, I find it very hard to, to, to have, uh, uh, to, to work with, with colleagues in Africa at, at the moment. Um, uh, and, and challenging and also rewarding. So the, the, the contact, so, sorry? You're cutting off maybe just with me, I'm not sure. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try again. So the, the context that, sh that they're studying also shapes the situation in which we were. Well, that, that's, um, uh, in fact, it's a continuation indeed of, of the comment of, of Amar, I think, the discussion that Amar opened. Um, uh, and so um, for me, this is um, something in which, um, um, yeah, I, I th so as a European academic, I think I have to work with, with African colleagues because it's uh, Europe does lots of stuff in, in Africa and we need to, to get uh, uh, different perspectives than, than, the, than, than the, the European academic 
make uh, echo change uh, on the table, but then we, we do work in this in, in this echo chamber. So it's it's a, it's a it's a problematic uh, process. Um, um, as an as a, as an um, um, so I'm, I'm a bit optimistic in thinking it's possible, but I think we have to, to make a good try. But uh, so I do recognize that the idea, like oh, if we just include uh, global south scholars, then things are okay. No, because it's it's it, I mean the consequence will be that, that 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 the discussion will change and the nature of the discussion will change and that things that we as Europeans find incredibly important turn out to be provisional issues, but uh, for variety, you no, know, I think it will it will hurt and, and will be problematic and, and, and um, it, it's not just uh, add and stir. Great, I mean, if, if, you, if our chair would allow me, um, a colleague recently um, brought together um, <clears throat> six African scholars and experts the, the way they did the grant structure was it was built on two years of consultations and thinking together and writing the grant together rather than just inviting the scholars. So it was actually communal work. And then there were structures uh, built in for um, equal representation and, and thorough, uh, thorough feedback and the right to veto issues that related to African continent although the, the money was coming out of the Canadian government. So I think there are new models being built, but thank you, I really appreciate your response. Um, our next question is uh, Risa. Uh, hi, uh, I'm listening to you from Kabul, Afghanistan, and I am really, really appreciate this, this workshop and especially Thomas' insight and I should apologize for my broken English. Uh, just one point I want to add what Nergis said about the research in Global South. I'm as a researcher in Afghanistan, witnesses many cases that normally the local researchers is using as a data collectors, not as those who design the research because defense is coming from the global north. And since some of the organizations, I mean, the donors oblige the global north researchers to have a global south partner for the reason of localizing the knowledge, but it's itself some sort of, it's become, I mean, the partnership become just some sort of legitimizing process for global north researchers to have someone from the global north but not as a person who involved from the very beginning stage of the research which is design but it's, it's, it's completely global north questions global north theories and then it's coming for testing theories in the global south especially using the local researcher as a data collectors uh, the second point uh, which I want to share is about the, the colonial nature of the uh, international law. It is very simply with looking at the terms in the international law. Like in Afghanistan, in, in Farsi, in Persian language, we don't have the equal term for IDP or refugee or migrants. Normally we use one word, which is muhajir. So looking at the words it shows, which is not international, it's just most European uh, oriented. And the third things and the last things I want to mention is the uh, joint way forward, which is the European deals with Afghanistan, which in nature is very colonial in terms of the refugee and migrants, because the European countries using the development aid to pressure on Afghanistan government to control and accept the deportees from European country. So it's, it's itself, I mean, pushing pressure using development aid to Afghan government sign uh, this agreement, which is completely, you know, using the power of uh, these development aid against the weak governments to do what they want in terms of the refugees or deportees uh, and tanks. If anything is, uh, is not clear, I, uh, so I can explain. 
uh, thank you. You were you were perfectly clear uh, and 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 well audible. Um, what you what you uh, uh, what what you what you uh, put on the table resonates a lot with me. Um, 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 I think um, I mean collecting data in the global south is a classical colonial strategy, and it's now very much visible in in migration. Um, and indeed, I often feel that that um, uh, colleagues in uh, in my case in Africa are used in a way that that resembles the way in which natural resources in Africa are used. Like you you grab it, and then the the, the Europeans do the do the do the do the analysis. This is a very problematic process. Together with a, a, a with a, with a group of colleagues in uh, in in Africa and and the Middle East. We've tried to 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 we have actually designed a uh, a setup to uh, allow uh, colleagues in Africa and the Middle East to get independent, uh, uh, to get funding for independent research. Uh, and we, we then approached funders uh, saying, well, you, you're all for decolonizing knowledge production and for de decolonizing this and that. And some funders were very interested and thought it was all great until they reached the point where they said, and so the, the idea was to, to, to allow uh, uh, African and, and Middle Eastern uh, colleagues to, 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 to write articles and to, to give them uh, uh, grants, essentially, uh, without the funder deciding what the topic and the methodology would be. Um, very well reputed funders broke off the talks as soon as they asked the question. But the question was, what is the added value? And then when we said, well, the added value is that colleagues in Africa and the Middle East will be able to, to define their own research agenda, at least for this one bit, then they, they backed out because that was too much. Apparently there was too much decolonization because they still wanted uh, 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 to, to, to steer uh, uh, researchers so that they would do useful things. Uh, so I, I find it I find it very frustrating. We have we have two 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 very small uh, uh, kind of projects, but we the, the bigger thing um, hasn't happened so far. I'm not sure whether it happens. So it's it's the the, the problem is it's very deep. It's it's it goes very deep. It's it's uh, I, in, in, in the beginning I was very optimistic because of the very positive responses of 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 these well reputed uh, funders, um, but in the end it it's I think it's too much for them. Are there uh, any other questions before we uh, finish up today? Going once, going twice. Uh, okay. So um, uh, before we uh, finish, I did just want to um, uh, note that the, the issues that, that uh, we've been uh, discussing here around uh, the relationship between methods and uh, and, and ethics uh, in research on on migration is um, a topic that the uh, Center for Refugee Studies has uh, put uh, quite a bit of time into thinking about in the last few years, and some of that uh, thinking uh, has uh, been uh, reproduced uh, in a free open access uh, book published uh, by the University of Calgary uh, Press, and I've given you a a link uh, in uh, the uh, the chat, uh, so you can uh, take a look at that. Uh, I think uh, our thinking uh, on these questions continues to be uh, a work uh, in uh, progress, uh, much as um, in my own uh, research uh, at the intersection of of, uh, of human rights and uh, um, migration and, and refugee uh, issues. I continue to. Uh, wonder uh, about uh, whether in my own work I'm giving sufficient space to um, uh, voices from uh, the global uh, south, uh, wondering uh, whether the frames that I use are um, uh, creating barriers uh, to, uh, uh, to reconciliation, uh, for example. Um, so these are, are ongoing challenging uh, questions, but I, I think it's worth uh, taking a look at uh, one of what some of the folks connected with uh, uh, CRS have tried to come up with in terms of answers to uh, uh, some of those questions. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that book. Um, I uh, found the, uh, the conversation uh, today uh, to be uh, really uh, interesting, uh, provocative, 
uh, challenging. Um, I'm uh, really grateful uh, to uh, Thomas for uh, bringing these uh, themes uh, to the table here at, uh, at CRS. Uh, I'm uh, grateful for the, the thoughtful uh, paper uh, that made me rethink some of the things that I thought that I knew uh, about the foundation of uh, international uh, migration law. So thank you very much uh, for the presentation uh, and uh, for uh, the paper. Uh, Yadil and uh, Amar, uh, thank you so much for uh, the um, rich additions to uh, the uh, discussion. Um, uh, thank you in particular, uh, Amar, for um, asking uh, that um, uh, we uh, pay very close attention to uh, whether the methods that we're using um, reflect uh, our uh, aspirations uh, to uh, connecting uh, some of the um, absences, I think, in, in, in our work to uh, ongoing uh, social justice uh, efforts. So I'm, I'm quite grateful uh, to uh, both of you uh, for your interventions as well. And finally, I'm grateful to uh, everyone who uh, participated today, uh, whether asking questions or uh, simply as a member uh, of uh, the audience. Uh, it has been a challenging time since uh, we had the last uh, Howard Edelman uh, lecture where we were able to gather uh, in person um, and to chat with one another afterwards uh, over uh, coffee and uh, treats. Uh, we unfortunately can't do that uh, here today. I wish we could because there's so much I'd like to uh, chat about uh, with you, Thomas. Um, but uh, I am uh, hopeful uh, that uh, we will have the opportunity to have more in-person engagement uh, in uh, the coming years where we'll have those uh, opportunities to have conversations with one another. So thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you, uh, especially to Thomas, uh, for participating uh, today. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance uh, to reconnect uh, soon.